Hello again, and welcome to the May 29th, 2018 uh, edition, you might say, of the Homeschooling Help with Andrea Schwartz. And here we go. I have to get myself on here. Uh, anyway, uh, today we're going to talk about something that I think is really important. We're going to talk about tough, sensitive issues that need to be discussed with children. And there are a variety of them. And we'll go through them one at a time. But the more important aspect of this is to embrace the principle that you have to teach the real before you present the counterfeit. So when we're talking about real issues of life and death and sexuality and health and um, sexual abuse and all these kinds of things, First and foremost, children need to know what God's word says about these things. And when that is the foundation of what it is they know and what they understand their parents are certain about, then they are much better positioned to recognize evil, heresy, and things that are just not quite right. So I'm going to bring... Um, my co-host, Nancy Wilk of Church in Maine in Appomattox, Virginia. Hi, Nancy. Good morning, friend. How are you? I'm well. So Nancy's going to sort of flesh out, before we actually get into the meat of this, some of the issues that um, have either come to her attention because in her mentorship position or even things she had to deal with herself, uh, as she was raising her children. So I'll turn it over to you, Nancy, to kind of flesh out the issues that people have to deal with. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, as homeschoolers, as well as parents, we know that real life happens and real life is messy and it's full of questions and questions that every single kid will want to know why. Why is it like this? Why, 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 why? And I don't think that a parent can really raise a child without being able to put those questions into a biblical context. If no, if nothing else, we need to be able to say, because God made it that way. A lot of people are concerned about um, homeschooling. They think they can't do it. What about, you know, what about when um, you have to move or what if your husband loses a job or what if? You know, what about when this ba other baby comes? There's all kinds of um, situations where people might be hesitant to to homeschool or they might be hesitant to really talk to their kids about some things. There's lots of reasons why they may be hesitant. But we really do believe and understand that the whole world is our classroom. God is sovereign over all of our affairs and whatever circumstances he brings to our day, we need to be able to deal with them properly. So let's talk about something, you know, like, like death, life and death that happens to all of us. Let's put that in the biblical context so that when grandpa dies or the dog dies or the cat brings you that mouse to the, Porch. I mean, how do you talk about those things from the little ones to the big ones? Let's jump in there. Okay. Those are all really good mundane down to earth examples. Before I get into it, let me just say one thing. Okay. The very reason that a lot of opponents of Christian education try to stop it is for the very thing that we're talking about right now. The ability to instill a Christian world and life view. They would much rather have your children in preschool and kindergarten to be able to communicate a different world and life view. And mm -hmm. so it's really important that we see that homeschooling goes beyond optional. It's really fundamental to building a Christian civilization. But back to grandpa dies or the pet dies or the pet is sick and we're going to put down the pet, but grandpa is sick. Are we going to put down grandpa? Right. This legitimate is legitimate questions. Those are really serious questions. questions. Yeah. I think everybody should spend time around children if you want to be real. If you want to mm -hmm. be real, hang around with children because they will ask you the questions that everybody else wants to ask. But, you know, 
I feel stupid if I ask, or people will think I'm not very smart or whatever it is. So that's where I said at the outset, we've got to instill God created you. So as soon as that child is in within earshot of anything you can say or do, whether or not you're convinced that this child understands what you're saying, that God created you. There was a time that we didn't know you. And then we became aware of the fact that you were here and being all through the Bible. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die going right into the sovereignty of God that we don't have to be afraid of things. If we trust the fact that God is in control, Mm -hmm. then when grandpa dies or the, the animal is so sick and it's time to show tender mercies to our animal that we recognize the difference and we share the difference that animals are different than people. Um, Animals are part of God's creation, but they were not made in God's image and likeness. And what's true for animals is not always true for people. No, we can't be cruel to animals any more than we can be cruel to people. But the life of a human being is mandated to have certain boundaries in terms of when that life can be taken, if it can be taken, and when it cannot. So that's what I said by knowing the genuine before the counterfeit or another world in life view comes into play. Right. Because if you believe what the movies say, all dogs go to heaven and all people go to heaven. And we have to be able to address that in biblical terms. Okay, hold on a second. I just got. Sorry, I hadn't put you on to share this. So everybody, that's Nancy. You were just hearing her. My flunk, I shouldn't have done it that way. So thanks, Kelsey, for letting me know that Nancy wasn't showing up. All right. So there's Nancy. Oh, hi. Uh, <laughs> she was being very nice without even knowing she wasn't on, on the screen with me. All right. So um, so life and death, these were the issues that um, you know we start talking about. But then there's sexuality. Mm, yeah. And that starts right when you get born. You can look and uh, I mean, you know, there's a whole lot about sexuality, not just sex, but gender and how God made you. And if that's OK or if you if it's OK to have two moms or, you know, all that stuff. It, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. We really do have to be able to just to, to put these questions and these concerns in the biblical context, what does God say first? And let me just add, let me just add, it's a lot harder for parents today when pulpits and the culture in general is so are so silent in terms of God's authorized way of living. We like to think that everybody should make their own choices. Everybody should decide for themselves. So if little Johnny feels like Jane, we shouldn't hamper him. Instead of looking at that, as a spiritual attack on Johnny, we're supposed to look at it as something different. And so currently having a good foundation yourself to be able to deal with things. And I'm not suggesting that you start off with your five-year-old and say to her, you know, we don't want you to change your gender orientation. That would be teaching the counterfeit as opposed to teaching the genuine. Now, let me give you an example. My granddaughter, we were talking once, and she told me when she was older, she was going to marry her daddy. Well, Mm -hmm. a little girl doesn't say she wants to marry her daddy. She loves her daddy. Her daddy takes care of her. She respects her daddy. But that was the opportunity for me to say, no, dear, you will never marry your daddy. Your daddy is married to your mommy, and they have an exclusive relationship that's just theirs. Now, you can still love him as a daughter, and he loves you as a daddy, but you will never be married to him because God says you shouldn't. But the good news is because you love him so much and you respect him, you'll probably look for someone who's like your daddy and your Mm -hmm. daddy will make sure as much as he can that you are married to someone who will care for you and love you as much as he does. So we've just gone into taking something that the child said and then sharing it in such a way that in the future, if something comes up, there's this reference point that's already been established and has um, been reinforced as you come along to certain passages of scripture and say, yes, that's what I was telling you about. Remember, that's what that was about. 
Mm -hmm. Right, right. I, I think that sometimes we make the mistake of um, imagining that it's going to be harder than it really is. If we will just be honest and answer their initial questions appropriately instead of leaving them in a vague space, then it's much easier to handle these things um, as as they come up. Like you said, I have an example. There was um, a little girl I know who was very um, whose whose mom and dad were not bashful about identifying the body parts appropriately. So she learned that she had a vagina and that her dad had a penis and that one day she said, mama and um, mama and I have vaginas. Daddy doesn't have one. And so, you know, some people might say, oh, that be horrified by that. But the mom said, yes, God has made us differently and that's OK. And not to have to be bashful about even even um, calling things what they are. Appropriate names for our body parts. Sin is sin. This is the way God made it to be. And we don't need to be uh, making imaginary stories or letting things pretend to be what they're not. Right. There's nothing in the scripture that will tell us about the birds and the bees. The birds and the bees. What are the birds and the bees? These are euphemisms that will say, you know what? We don't want to talk about these things. Now, in terms of that little girl, it would also be appropriate to say, these are the ways that we identify these things. But in general conversation, it's usually something we don't talk about the same way we don't talk about what we made when we went to the bathroom and what it right. looked like if we were sick and we vomited or whatever it is. So there's basic decorum that is taught, but in terms right. of not making it something that, oh, we don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Another good example of life and sex is when there's already children in the family and mom's pregnant. You know, the stork didn't bring the baby and right you know, whatever other things come about and not to give over, you know, overload the child on things that, you know, at age four or age seven, he's really not interested in the tubes and the, and the organs of the body and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But there mm -hmm. you reinforce the fact that God made these things and God is the one who fashioned it. And, you know, we pray for a healthy baby. We might not have a healthy baby. Right. No. The train. There's the train in the background. Um, so, go. You were going to say something? Uh, yeah. Um, I was just going to say that um, that's just an example. Of course, there are a, a appropriate places to discuss those things and times, but that um, that we can start that simply uh, and about what's true, and not be bashful about addressing them clearly and distinctly and right. appropriately. Right now, so we've talked about marriage and we've talked about sexuality. A uh, really timely question is: How do you prevent your children from being victimized by somebody who wants to take uh, sexual advantage of them or inappropriate behavior? Again, as you're explaining the exclusivity of marriage, you let them know that no one is to have a relationship with you, boy or girl, man or woman, outside the context of marriage. Uh -huh. So again, we're affirming God's order. And so letting children know that there are some people who don't obey God, some who purposely disobey God. And these are the kinds of things that you might notice if somebody is approaching you incorrectly. The safe way is that we'll always be with you or have you under the control or charge of somebody who we trust. Mm -hmm. But even then, you have the responsibility to recognize that your body is not open to anybody's touching or viewing or whatever it is, and that under no circumstances is it ever appropriate to keep that secret from us. That one of the ways you'll know to suspect a person is that person wants you to keep a secret from your mommy or your dad. Mm -hmm. Right. And we need to make the distinction between, um, you know, uh, bad secrets and good secrets. 
you know, like we don't want to tell what the birthday present is, but there are some things that's private that need to be kept private. Right. And I would even say in most cases, if as an adult, you're concerned that your children can't keep the secret, well, then don't tell them about the birthday present, but reinforce <laughs> the idea that mm -hmm. anybody who's saying your mom and dad don't need to know this, or you will be in trouble if not, that's why you tell them ahead of time. What gets you in trouble is disobeying God, not thinking that this person will hurt mommy and daddy if you tell the truth, because if you tell the truth to mommy and daddy, we can help you. And mm -hmm. we're right back into scripture. The truth sets you free, not lies, not deceptions, not secrets. Yes. Yes. Very so, good. you know, we've covered life and death. We've talked a little bit about euthanasia because, you know, is it okay to have grandpa put down like we would put down, um, you know, a dog or something like that. And so again, what's infused in teaching is teaching people as it's appropriate. And if you go through the scriptures, trust me, it'll be appropriate. I remember I used to tell my husband, because I would go through the book of Proverbs with my kids individually. And since my kids are spaced enough that I could do it individually. And the book of Proverbs, you're going to cover everything. <laughs> you're going to have to talk about a lot of things and explain the adulterous woman. You're going to have to explain what wickedness is. Again, having that foundation there before there is the bombardment from the world with all these other views. Now, am I suggesting that we teach our children to be haters so if you meet somebody who's confused about his gender or you meet somebody who, you know, holds to a view that says two people of the same gender can marry and, 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 and love each other, go over it with your children. Demonstrate the fact that Jesus came to save the lost and we don't do anybody any favors by pretending their sin is righteousness but also let them understand there are certain circumstances where you remain quiet and there are other circumstances and we'll help you know what those are where you'll discuss things. Right. There's things that we talk about in public. There's things that we talk about at home and the idea that it's just going to be about, um, about the sexuality of, um, homosexual or transgender people. There's also the idea that happens much more frequently where the kids have to meet daddy's girlfriend, you know, right. You, you got to deal with those too. Those are uncomfortable, uncomfortable situations. How do you explain them without having to, to put the biblical context before the child and say, this is what God says. This is what happens. This is what we're real, really dealing with. Right. What does God say about that? We've got to be able to do that every time. Right. And divorce was one thing I was going to bring up. It's a huge issue or cohabitation. Mm -hmm. What do mm -hmm. you do when auntie or grandma or someone is now uh, divorced, living in a way that she shouldn't? It wasn't a righteous divorce. A lot of parents are going to say, well, I don't want to bring this up with the kids because, you know, that's their aunt. That's their grandma. I think that's not only faulty reasoning, it's unbiblical reasoning. We don't do our children any favor by saying she's your grandma and whatever grandma does is right, even though what she's doing, according to God's word, is wrong. And so there is a sense of diplomacy. There is a sense of appropriateness. I know mm -hmm. Families that I mentor, what to do when the one of the parents of the parents just, you know, had a divorce. It wasn't a godly divorce. It wasn't biblical and is now remarrying. OK, so what do we do? Do we go to the wedding? Do we not go to the wedding? Well, I'm not going to give a formula that says you should do this or you should do that or you shouldn't do that. But what I am saying is it has to be viewed biblically and the decisions that you make before God then have to be communicated to your children. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it can get messy. Well, in a wicked and perverse generation, life is messy. 
-hmm. And that's why we are benefited by God's law because it helps us maneuver through that messiness. Right. And there's consequences to that messiness. You know, our kids, they grow up and not, you know, with, with such a, a mess. The only way to untangle these messes, like I, I've come from a messy background, you know, and the only way to untangle these messy things, the only way to, to find the safe place, the solid space where we can, from where we can build the life moving forward is to know what God's word says and to be able to firmly stand there. You know, the scripture tells us that the sins of the fathers are visited to the third and fourth generation. So that doesn't mean that my my grandkids are going to be cursed because of my sin, but but there is consequences. But it tells us that those consequences and the mercy of God are limited. And when we love God and teach our children to obey God, the blessings of that goes much, much longer than just the two or three generations or three or four rather. Right. And a lot of parents fall into the trap of saying, well, I did a lot of the things my kids are doing and who am I to talk? I did the same. You know, I remember Mm -hmm. what it was like being a young man. I remember what it was like being a young girl or whatever it is. See, we've got to get away from that. If we've been redeemed from our sins and God has shown us mercy, then we must use our past to be demonstrative of the fact that we were God's enemies and by his grace, we came into his family. So instead of saying, who am I to talk? What we should be saying is thus saith the Lord. This is what God's word says. And Mm -hmm. um, I know women who were very reluctant in sharing with their daughters that there was abortion in their past. And Mm -hmm. the reasoning was, well, if I tell them, they'll think it's okay to do it as well. And I said, well, that depends on how you tell them. If you tell them, I took the life of my unborn child. I have never looked back and said that was the right thing. I suffered greatly personally because I was filled with the guilt of having violated God's commandment. And I am grateful for God's mercy in terms of bringing me into his family and forgiving that sin. Now, if the child goes ahead and does the same thing, it's not on you. You've warned the child. You've given a testimony. And our testimony is what God has done for us. Not if I tell you this, you'll go ahead and be as bad as I was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Now, one of the things I did with my kids, and I then took it to the next level, There were lessons that we needed to teach, lessons about repentance, lessons about forgiveness, how about self-discipline and responsibility. And so when I was pretty much done with my homeschooling and I was thinking, I have a wealth of information here, what can I do with it? Well, there's expository writing and I have included some of the things that we taught in the, the books I've written, but I decided to write read aloud stories that would help parents approach the subject that sometimes are difficult to bring up. And so my first book was entitled Teach Me While My Heart is Tender. And those stories in that book uh, deal with repentance and forgiveness. And they were really designed, my, my husband used to joke and say, well, these are not kids books. These are books for parents because a lot of parents don't know how to bring up these issues. And then some years later, I came out with my second book and I entitled that Family Matters. And that had a double meaning. One, these were matters that happen in a family, but Mm -hmm. family matters. This is the first church, the first school, the first job that anyone ever has. And I brought up things like self-control, self-discipline and the responsibility of children. Um, I've always thought of writing some more. I haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, Usually by the time I'm ready to write them, they just sort of flow out. And in each case, I was able to get them illustrated by a budding artist who had never really had a lot of their artwork published. So I was able to help someone along the lines as well. Um, But I really encourage people who especially had young children. And I know that you said that you read that first book to your grandkids. Why don't you talk a little bit about what effect it had when they were hearing those stories? 
Well, first of all, my grandkids are wide open and they seldom sit down. But when I sit down with this book, it's a little chapter book. I don't know how many chapters you have, probably six, right? Four, well, the six. The second one has, I think, four or five. And the first one had three, actually. They sat down and absolutely listened to that whole book cover to cover. And when they finished, Andrea, I don't know if you remember this or not, when we finished, my granddaughter had some questions about who these children were in this story and wanted to, wanted to know about it. I said, I don't really know who these children are, but I know the lady that wrote the story and we can call her. And do you remember um, we called and you were so generous to um, answer the question um, that River had about the about the book and explained that you had changed the names to protect the guilty. Right. Which is wonderful. We appreciate that so much. <laughs> right. And I know when I read it to my grandchildren, um, especially some of the stories had to do with their father and they were wide eyed saying, this was dad. And I said, yeah. And of course, one of them who's a little spitfire said, tell me other bad things dad did. <laughs> and I said, well, why don't you tell me if there's some bad things you've done that are contrary to God's law? The purpose wasn't to, you know, reveal people's sin. The purpose was to deal with sin. And the truth of the matter is the very first story in that book has to do with a true story that had to do with my own sin. And mm -hmm. I had to ask forgiveness. And that was a huge issue because a lot of parents don't think that they should ask their children for forgiveness which is a huge mistake because you never want the children to think that there's a different set of rules that apply to you that apply to them. Certainly there are more options you have as an adult than children, but the same God who governs them is the God who governs us and their obedience will be received with blessing just like ours. And so I think that's probably the most fundamental lesson that parents need to teach their children we all serve God and we have to live out our callings appropriately, but that his word, his law is what has to be followed. Right. Right. And so that also will begin to put into context when grandma or um, aunt or cousin or brother or whoever is, is living a lifestyle of sin. We can love them. We can pray for their repentance and, Regardless of what they're doing, we still have to choose to obey God. And so so to teach them in that way will will help to to address all the different variant variables that they find as they go through their day. Right. I have some good friends who run Christian schools and mm -hmm. This is the kind of story you wouldn't necessarily hear in a homeschool because the situation is different, which I'll explain. So a lot of times parents who aren't believers will put their children in a Christian school because they appreciate the discipline. They appreciate the academic rigor. Well, right. part and parcel of being in a Christian school is that Christian doctrine and morality will be taught. And there have been not a few actually more than a few cases where children went home and explained to mom, you're living in sin and you shouldn't mm -hmm. do that anymore. Or the family was Hindu and the child came back and talked about the commandments of God. Now, mm -hmm. if you're going to a Christian school and you pay people to go ahead and, and, and teach your children, you're going to expect that they're going to communicate their world and life view, right. which is so sad that there are Christians who place their children in state-run humanistic schools and somehow are oblivious to the fact that their children are being indoctrinated, their children are being religiously trained. So mm -hmm. however you do it, a, a Christian day school or Christian homeschool, the, the benefit and the responsibility both of instilling this biblical world and life view, giving the child a chance to respond to truth, as opposed to responding to the deception and lies that come under the banner of humanism. Right. Yes. That is the beauty of homeschool and the responsibility of homeschool to put all of every one of our days in the context of ordained and created by God. Right. 
and why it's very fundamental for parents to be prepared for the task. And you may have, you know, as a homeschooling parent, you may have decided, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I think I need to do it. Well, okay, that's fine. There are things in place. My Cal Seton Teacher Training Institute is a website that will help you get started in terms of educating yourself. And there are plenty of mentors around, people like you and me, who've been through this journey and now are responding to God's call to be the people to help these newbies who are coming along, or even people who are established in their homeschooling, but sometimes just need some encouragement. We remember the days of needing encouragement. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I still, there's there's still days when we need a friend to say, help me remember what I was supposed to be doing here. And so that's what we want to do. That's what, that's what I think uh, I know that I want to do as a mentoring um, Titus two woman. And I know that you do too. Our heart is to help young folks and one another remember God's call in our life and to walk in a manner worthy of his calling. Right. And so let me invite anybody who's either watching live or will see a, um, a shared version of this video. We're available to help. No question is a dumb question. And we're interested in helping you fulfill that call on your life that you feel God is doing. Uh, Nobody should entertain the idea of parenting or educating apart from obedience to God. But a lot of people come into an understanding of this midway. They're already parents. They're already homeschooling. The beauty is um, a little bit of obedience goes a long way. And God promises blessings for obedience. So it's not like you have to wait a long time to receive the blessings that he promises. Amen. Thank you, Andrea. All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. We'll see you guys next time. And until then, um, keep doing what God calls you to do and let us know um, if there's any way that we can help. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right.